So Simon, you've just delivered this amazing report after a huge amount of work. What do you think are the real big headlines for all of us? Well, I guess that the main, if I was to start the whole report, it came from one of our service users who actually works with the college very closely, who said she, looking back, could understand why she was sectioned and that it had saved her life. And then she wanted to say, but why was it such an awful experience? Yeah. Does it have to be that bad? And also, that even though when I was very ill and indeed in danger of taking my own life, I could still take other decisions about my treatment. Yes. And it was like I was a non-person. And I think it was that. We think mental health that remains fundamentally important to a civilised society. It's kind of brokering the tension between people's right to autonomy, but also the state's duty to look out for the most vulnerable. And that's what a mental health act does. You don't want to be in a country that doesn't have a mental health act. No. I, I mean, my understanding of the act has always been that it does really force that flexibility, that even if your decision making may be a bit impaired over one thing like whether you need to be in hospital. Mm. Still it needn't be impaired over other things like whether you take a decision about particular treatments or mm. management of your affairs and things. I thought well, that was there in there. Well not really. I mean what happens is uh, already advanced directives for example, people can make them. But they don't. And they don't because they know that we can completely ignore them. And one of the things we're bringing in is to make it much harder to overrule them. Right. So if you made a, 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 a statement, you know, and next time I don't want drug A, but I'll take drug B, then there has to be a pretty good reason for why we won't follow that. Okay. That's really helpful, mm -hmm. and I think that's very relevant for us in the forensic psychiatry, because of course we have the time to work yes. out <laughs> yes. proper, decent treatment yep. strategies with yep. people. And, and I think I recall you saying too that um, although this is necessary for an advance um, directive statement, it would greatly reinforce it if the patient and the clinician signed it off together as exactly. something that they really exactly. agreed about. Even then, at no point do we say um, an advanced decision is 100% binding. We were pushed towards that. We said, no, psychiatry doesn't Things work like change. that. Things yeah. can change, but, but it will have much greater um, backing. And indeed, um, if you don't follow it, now what the RRC has to do is to show their working, to show their homework, and that could be appealable. Yeah. And it's the same, we are insisting now that you do a capacity assessment. Because it, I mean, it's ridiculous at the moment. We don't know how many of our patients actually lack capacity. Everybody does them, but they're not formally recorded. And we have no statistics, we have no idea whether we could support a fusion app should one come in. So throughout then is, is this idea of greater choice. Um, and then we take other things like CTOs, for example, which are very controversial. And as you know, you and I are car-carrying academics, we know the evidence is oh, not great. But during the course of the review, having started thinking we should abolish them, I changed my mind and thought, actually, there are people for whom I think they do good. Yeah, this is the reference, just so that we don't do acronyms, to community treatment yes. orders, yeah. and specifically the ones from the Act, whereby you have to have been in hospital, yeah. and then yeah. um, the psychiatrist can say, but you are going to... Um, and have this kind of order when you leave. So what we've done is the essence of it, we've made it harder to get onto them and easier to get off. Mm -hmm. And after a certain period of time, the balance shifts. Instead of the patient having to prove that they're not going to relapse, which is fundamentally quite difficult, difficult now it's the us, the RC, who has to, who has to prove it, yeah. which is also so fundamentally... It, it has, yes. yes. And yes. the idea, we want to halve the number of CTOs. So we've resisted the calls to uh, end them completely. But if in five years' time the situation has got better, then probably that is what our successors will end up doing. Right. Now the other thing, which is a general thing, but which I think is of great interest to, to us in forensics country, because of the problem that a lot of the violence happens within the family, is that there's going to be a shift in who we would regard as the nearest relative, right. or how to define the yes. nearest relative. Can you just yep. run through that for us? Well, for those who don't know, the, the, the nearest relative clause is a very Victorian hierarchy. I mean, it really reads like it was written in the Victorian age, actually it wasn't. But it has a strict uh, hierarchy of definition. It really doesn't bear any relationship to what modern family structures are, uh, relationships, etc. You do so always tempt me when you say that to remind you of Mary Lamb, who after she killed her father, 
uh, was very, very briefly in an asylum, and then cared for by her brother. Yes, Charles is right. Who then, yeah. only if she got very sick indeed, would put her into a private asylum for a short time and then take her back again. So, in, in some ways... There's, there's nothing wrong with the near asylum, <laughs> but it needs to be more flexible for the yes. modern times. Yes. And what we heard was a lot, quite a few patients didn't like the fact that it's imposed on you yes. from the hierarchy. And there are one or two, I agree, rare, but one or two cases in which the law dictates what the nearest relative would be, and if someone actually is intimately connected, for example, with abuse, you yes. don't need very many cases of that exactly. to think that's not exactly. right. So there will now be more choice, which everyone agrees with. And that choice will come from, from the patient, the, from as, the far patient as, as far as possible. As far as possible from the patient. Um, now, but we op I openly admit it, writing it, that there will be times in which someone will make not a terrible decision, but not the best decision, yes. Yes. and that will disadvantage the kind of person who might actually be the one looking after you. And I'm afraid that's true, that yes. will happen. But when you do increase choice, unfortunately you do allow people to make yes. not dreadful decisions, but perhaps slightly unwise decisions. Yes. But there will still be the ability to change, to challenge, etc. But again, greater preference will be given to the person's wishes, and um, there was a very strong view that that was, that was important. It does look, it looks very old fashioned what we've got. Okay, I, I think mm. we mm. all agree with that and, and, and appreciate that step forward. And uh, I suppose that's a good point at which to ask, supposing this becomes law, um, what steps would you envisage to evaluate its impact? Have you somehow managed to get built into the process that it will be evaluated? Which is well, <laughs> I, it's a very good question actually, I'm not entirely sure. I mean obviously, um, well people have done trials of bits of the, the, the community treatment tool is a classic example where trials have been done. In general, it isn't the part of... of well the more classic example mm -hmm. is with the changes in the 83 Act and the pressure against 28 uh, against the three-day orders yes. because they were not appealable into 28-day orders and exactly the same number of people were detained except that they were all detained for 28 days rather than three days. Well, the, the kind of thing that we would like to see to show that it, it's, the changes are working would first of all be a decrease in the level of compulsion. Yes. So yes. in particular would be a decrease in the level of people we think inappropriately putting into the Mental Health Act who really should be managed under the mental capacity legislation because we know that's one of the biggest uh -huh. reasons for uh -huh. the increase um, in um, uh, admissions uh, and detentions is that people are defaulting to the Mental Health Act because it's familiar, easier, less bureaucratic and um, we're bringing in, well, recommending a very clear cut boundary which is on objection. The Mental Health Act should be used for people who are objecting in the normal English language sense, not the Supreme Court sense of this, but the, in the way that we would use objecting in a normal conversation, which I think is actually, that's manageable, it's accessible, it's clear cut to what we mean. So we'd like to see that happening. Mm. Well, I think that's what everyone would like to yeah. see, but of course that brings us back to a very central point, that the law is to fix what the law can fix. Yes. And most of us have the suspicion, if not understanding, if not some evidence, for the idea that the reason for increase of interventions, which is after all entirely within the acute hospitalisation mm. block, so not the long-term detentions, it's only the 28-day quarter yeah. detentions that have gone up, it's because of the lack of resource to treat people earlier before right. they actually need that. We make that clear from, from the first moment to the last, that of the things we want to happen in mental health care, 80% of them are not to do with the Mental Health Act. We did get quite a few mentions in the long-term plan of things that will help these issues but are not legal. For example, a call for a major investment in our decaying plant, which is looking to the yeah. estate. Yeah. And there will be a bid in the, strategy, in the uh, common, uh, comprehensive spending review uh, for that. Now that's not the Mental Health Act, but if we are going to detain people against their wishes, we are putting them in the physical environment. This calculates and not to help them get better. Yeah. And so that's not the, the act can't mandate that, but the yeah. overall, you know, the, the spending yeah. review can. And they might not have got yeah. into the position of needing potential. No, of course, yeah. and, and everyone agrees that more alter one of the reasons is lack of alternatives. You know, by the, and, and when we started it out, I remember the Prime Minister saying on, on, when she launched um, the election campaign, 
wouldn't go so well. But, but she said, um, we should tear up the Mental Health Act and all these unnecessary admissions. And I think we convinced her that actually, by the time it gets to an admission, it's yes. very rarely unnecessary. Yes. And yes. could we switch to say, preventable? Yes. Okay, or yes. avoidable, yes. and then we would all agree with that, yes. but, but yes. unnecessary? Yes. No. Um, yes. So I'm rambling a little bit now, and I can't remember what the okay. question was. Well, but all I know, it was the legislation. Oh, resources, resources. Yeah, his resources. resources. <laughs> and, and finally, you know, the, the mental health fact, and Lewis Appleby taught me this, is not a substitute for good care. Excellent, yes. And that's, that's in the report? That's, yes, excellent. Yeah, I don't, I don't no, acknowledge no, no, I Lewis really saying important. that, but he did. Then, the, the, mm. the issue, just briefly, we've talked in general terms, but we really do need to focus on the forensic bits a little bit because this is a forensic conference. And um, it's tough because there are relatively small numbers of people yes. affected by this. Um, nevertheless, you can argue that they're the most important people because the deprivations of liberty are extreme in those cases, may even be indefinite. And so we had concerns about um, some aspects of those indefinite detentions, and one of them uh, was the difficulty um, that there is no sure way of moving people between right. levels yes. of security. Yes. Even when people are agreed, the clinicians are agreed, yeah. that high security, for example, is no longer necessary, mm -hmm. patients can get stuck. Absolutely right. And, and what we came up with was the idea of this is a bit like, um, when I was learning family therapy, and this is, you know, this is a family therapy intervention because we have um, our side of the road clearly wants to um, uh, it, it wants to do that uh, to to uh, reduce the length of stay, but in particular to move people quicker down levels of security. Their side of the road, the criminal justice system, wants us to take over some of the people in prison and clearly shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. But both sides, it's like mummy and daddy, have to both agree for something to happen. So what we're proposing is that on the one hand, MOJ, Ministry of Justice, um, relaxes some of its powers of the Secretary of State in the management of, of restricted patients, okay? Um, and we propose a traffic light system. There'll be some cases where the public interest is so high, these will be the red lights, in which the Secretary of State will retain all powers. But that's not that many of the people. And there'll be others in which um, they will uh, have lesser powers or indeed transfer right. those powers. Yes. yes. And yes. The, the, the key statistic that I didn't know was that in these cases, 94% of the time, the MOJ actually do agree with what the clinicians and the RCs want, but it takes two to three years. Mm -hmm. So the number of occasions where there's disagreements is very low, which suggests that a more smooth system uh, would lead to more places being then available to take people from prison, who everyone agrees shouldn't be there, and also then more flexibility dealing. Now, I don't know if that's going to be accepted or not, and because there is a reluctance for, this, it doesn't come from the Secretary of State themselves actually, I'm very keen on this, but actually the, the whole apparatus of government around the Ministry of Justice isn't so keen. So we'll have to see what happens in the legislative scrutiny, right. but I'm, I'm pretty confident that what we will get is a much more speeded up process, perhaps with targets, um, particularly because of that statistic, that we get there in the end. So why can't we get there quicker? That, that would help in terms of testing people out. Mm -hmm. um, but it does seem to me that there are still blocks and that it could be helpful and there's a parallel in Scotland um, yeah, exactly. where Scotland, and nothing bad's happened, no. in fact a lot of good things have happened, is Scotland having the possibility for tribunal or the equivalent of a tribunal to intervene yes. if people get stuck. Yes. In other words, we'd extend the tribunal power, the tribunal would no longer be restricted to just a discharge, no discharge of the order, but could vary the conditions. You, you can see that that's what we're recommending. Okay. And the fact that the Scots did it, I mean, I hate to say this, but they are ahead of the game. They are. They are. And so far, um, there have been no mishaps. Now, of course, it's a much smaller system. It's easier to administrate when people know each other more. And it's, it is quite noticeable. Mental health acts seem to work better in the smaller jurisdictions. And we get yes. to, you know, an example yes. in, in, in Trieste and so on. Um, so it's, but it's still reassuring that the Scots have done this system mm -hmm. and there's been no mm -hmm. breakdown in public safety. And we, we can't ignore public safety in these issues. Not at all. Um, Which in turn is a sort of patient safety. Yes, it is it's as well. It's not any favours to the patients. But, but it's, it, 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 it is really interesting though that the, the climate of 30 years ago um, has changed and it seems like the general public are much more accepting of risk than they were 
30 years ago, or at least politicians are. Managers. Yeah, of course, yeah, of course, managers. And we, we, we can't, some people, you know, well-known colleagues of ours, very, very, very honourable and decent people, want us to simply remove risk completely. But I think that would be foolish, and that would lead to a catastrophic fall in public confidence. Yes, yes. That's really helpful. Thank you very much. Thank you.